Hello everyone, <clears throat> Paul McFarland here. Now, I am an Aquarius, which means I'm a very loyal, loyal human being. And I'm very, very passionately loyal <clears throat> to some of the brands that I've known my whole life. Now, I grew up, if there is such a thing, in St. Louis, which was famous for Anheuser-Busch. The big Budweiser sign on the building didn't say Anheuser-Busch, it said Budweiser. <clears throat> and growing up, watching the neighbor men and you know, after mowing the grass, some were reaching for a fall staff and some for a Budweiser. And in special, you know, weekend dinners, Michelob. And some of the women drank Michelob. And you'd get out in the world and you'd see what people drank. I lived in a very middle class, working class neighborhood. People who worked in the time when one person could work at a factory job, a union factory job, and buy a new car every two or three years, send the kids to college, and actually got and took four weeks of vacation, and the family took vacations every year. Yes, it really happened. <clears throat> but the point I'm trying to make is any brand that has any kind of success over time, it hurts me. It offends me very deeply as a professional to see when that brand, through lack of vision, guidance, the wrong agency, the wrong people in charge, whatever you want to call it, loses touch with what got it there in the first place. Like the old Texas swing song. You got to dance with who brung you. Swing with who swung you. Right? It's really important to understand that. And think of the people in our lives who we're friends with for a long time through the changes. If someone remains a friend, you've got a connection no matter what changes in their health and their looks and their hairline, their waistline, their relationships, their job, their economic status. You're, you've got a deep human connection. And in this case, um, I'm going to talk about uh, these originally St. Louis beer brands to make a point. I'm not here to pillory them. I'm not here to say, ha, 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 you made a mistake even though you may think so, we agree. I'm here to make a point about branding. If a business has got a good trajectory, six months, a year, two years after a startup, you've got to tend it really well. You've got to understand what its essence is, where it got you and where you can take it and what needs to come with you. So where do we begin well, the three beers I'll talk about is Budweiser, Bud Light, and most recently, Stella Artois. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, you know who I am, right? You've seen me on LinkedIn with posts like, and like, and like, and these, and these, and all those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My experience is with the global Fortune 500, and so when I talk about things, it's 98.999% experience, not just opinion, okay? Okay, let's begin. Budweiser, Bud Light, Stella Artois. This is a Budweiser can. Ah, what is that? It's never been filled. I was a collector. And this is actually a steel can, right? With a seam that's welded, right? And they were painted on their opaque paint. But here's what's really key. Look what it says under the word Budweiser. Lager beer. I thought it said King of Beers, Paul. Yes, it did. It should change some years ago. But, you know, this is a can from like 19, mid-1970s. The typography, everything changed. And you look how small Budweiser is compared to the way it is now. Uh, that's one thing. I always say, make your ads so interesting, people will look for your logo. Well, if your label is so cool, if your brand is so cool, people will find your name. Making it bigger and just having Bud and reaching around and going that way, it, I don't know. I know it's a design thing, but it also just kind of feels to a lot of people and more insecure. Well, Budweiser. In 1986 to 1988, it had its peak barrel sales, number one by far in the U.S. And when you say barrel sales, that means because barrels are sent to premise, as they call them, and off-premise, but also it equates to the barrels that are 
in the actual brewery that are put in bottles and cans. Barrel sales is how they measure. They were number one by a long shot. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole history of Budweiser because you can find it. Everything with Ed McMahon and sponsorships and Pick a Pair and the Clydesdales and boom, 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 boom. Now, well, let's talk for a second about the Clydesdales. If you understand human psychology at all and brands, people will glom onto anything that makes them feel good, whether it's relevant or not. Now, what do Scottish Highland horses that are giant and powerful and strong have to do with wanting to drink a beer? I have no idea. Horses don't drink beer. It says Budweiser on the wagon. It's a nonsensical, deep, emotional connection that people like. I don't understand it, but I like it. So when you read what real people say on YouTube, on the history of Budweiser commercial, you'll see what people have really reacted to. It's a sense of permanence, sentimentality, emotion, and even romanticism. And the playlets that happen around Turtle Farm, especially one of the places where the Clyde Seals are, uh, have really galvanized the emotional connection to those feelings of tradition, um, sentimentality, and permanence, right? You get the sense of the renewed generations of Clydesdales, but nothing really changed, right? There's that sense of being a brand that's going to be there. No matter where you go, there it is. Just like a parent, when your child individuates psychologically, goes off to college or whatever, you give them the freedom, but you need to be where they, where you are. So when they turn back and look for you, as they will do, they can still find you. They, as the explorer, need to know the parents are still their parents if and when they need them. Emotionally, intellectually, whatever, practically, right? You got to be there when they're looking for you. And that sense of permanence doesn't mean that you fall out of fashion. That just means you know who you are. Whether the flare of your trousers closes, if the color and the style of your shirts, the lapels, the style, all that can change. But you need to be who you are, where you are. So again, if you're a newer brand that's doing well, remember what is getting you there right now. There's something in your essence that if you want to be around for decades to come, generations to come, legacy growth, understand the essence of what made you successful in the first place. So Budweiser, late 80s, it was not only marketing, uh, packaging, it was distribution. The driver salesman network was powerful. Anheuser-Busch, uh, like a lot of successful married companies, even was rather bullish over some of the decades of pressurizing. They had the first refrigerated cars that allowed them to send their beer further away. Very smart, cunning in the business things. And the driver salesman, that means the guy who's driving, you know, the truck, delivery truck, is the salesperson. I'm your Budweiser guy, I'm bringing the beer. Here's our new posters. Hey, how are you? That deep human relationship, permanence, right? Maintaining over time. They understood that. Okay. Going from number one to number four in the United States, to me, is no mystery at all. The first thing is what began in the mid-1970s to late 1970s. The three major beer companies at that time was still Anheuser-Busch, Miller, and Schlitz. Remember Schlitz? Schlitz was a real contender during the 60s and 70s. It has gone away. Well, just talk Miller. It was, came out with the first one, you know, light beer from Miller, L-I-T-E. And they use comedy, Norm Crosby, and all the different things just to educate people what a light beer was. Budweiser came out first with Budweiser Light, and they changed it to Bud Light, a little more youthful name. But both of the major light beer brands, if you look at their first decade, first decade of, of advertising and branding, was educational. Same great taste less filling, everything you always wanted a beer, and less. Those were galvanizing brand educational messages that stuck because both those beer companies, as far as maintaining their flagship brands, shot themselves in their foot big time and continually over the decades. Because look, when you tell the American people that light beer is just as good as regular beer and has less calories, 
eventually the public will get it and say, okay, I heard you. Bud Light, please. Light beer. Phew, goodbye, regular beers. You have educated me and taught me repeatedly, consistently over decades that light beer is just as good as other beer. So why should anyone be surprised that Bud Light, Coors Light, and uh, Miller Light or whatever, you know, the top three are light beers. Do you see what happened? Are you getting this? If you tell the world that there's a new product of yours that's just as good as this one, has less calories, and some people say it was the American craze for fitness and jogging and health, yes. But see, if they came out with light beers to answer that, did they understand they were going to be killing their flagship brands? Well, they did. So, no surprise that America said, yeah, light beer, fine. If I'm just a young person trying to get a buzz on, who cares? If I'm celebrating with um, my coworkers, who cares? We're having a good time. It tastes enough like beer. After the second beer, you don't taste any way. You know, come on. It's literally, they said something and it came to be. We told you, drink light beer. It's just as good. And people said yes. So that was promoting a new brand, but killing one at the same time. And I don't think it needed to do that. In other words, the one brand of Anheuser-Busch, I think, knows what, what it is very well of the major ones is, Nat is um, Michelob Ultra. It says, if you work out, if you exercise, here's your beer. Very simple and knows what it is. It doesn't say if you're having pizza, you know, it doesn't say if you're you know, having a family reunion. No, it says if you are an exerciser, if you're a fitness person, here's your beer. And they just stay in that lane and they, they own that. And they can own that as long as people have bodies, if they're smart. So well done, that little category. So anyway, one reason why Budweiser used to be lager beer, right? And you could actually read what was on this. I can recite that, by the way. One of the reasons it's number four is because the parent company murdered it by telling the world light beer was just as good. But what could be done with Budweiser? Well, see, Budweiser and Bud Light, while Bud Light was not quite number one, and Bud, it was like this, Budweiser, Bud Light, Bud Light, Bud Light, Bud Light, Bud Light, Bud Light. The best way I can explain it is the two brands existed in the minds of people who drank it. And, you know, I've, most of my life, I've lived in the Midwest, you know, increasingly conservative, middle class, you know, the factory workers, you know, the laborers, that kind of stuff, tradition. Budweiser was sort of like the adult beer and Bud Light was its kind of stupid younger brother. If you looked at when Budweiser would do a joke, it would make a joke. But Bud Light commercials made a joke, had the logo, and had another joke at the end. It was like the dumb joke, the physical comedy. You know, it's like the kid who went off to college and didn't declare a major for three years, almost dropped out, got arrested, you know, all that kind of stuff. It was the stupid younger brother who liked beer. The joke was you see someone drinking a light beer like Bud Light. You say, oh, what's the matter? Don't you like beer? <laughs> Those of us who actually appreciate beers, right? Like me, I appreciate, you know, a, what do they call it? A European Pilsner lager or whatever. Like when you have hot, spicy food, you know, it, with a lot of flavor, the carbonation and the fizziness and, the, and the, when it's cold is really nice. It's like Indian food. It's kind of hard to have a flavor of a beer compete with Indian food, but Flying Horse is a great lager for doing that. So it has this place. So you have an adult brand and you have like the younger Silly Brother brand. Well, that lasts for a while until, again, most people start to migrate to light beers because they're believing what they're being told is just as good and doesn't matter. Now, as this started to happen, there was a lot of tremors in the Budweiser brand. And I'm not going to mention all of them because it went a lot of places. They had the, you know, what's up, you know, thing and the frogs, which were like the Clydesdales, irrelevant advertising, just sort of thingies that get out there. <clears throat> and the problem is when you do something like that, is it sustainable for many, many years? Mm, not really. You can bring it back and people remember, but it's not a sustaining 
um, message, or at least it wasn't treated as that. It was like a long one-off and a long one-off. <clears throat> but what happened was the revolving door of people in charge of Budweiser, and indeed the revolving door of brand managers all over America, just a few glances around LinkedIn of some of your connections, and you see people stay a year and a half, a year and a half, two years, three years and more is rare, unless you're someone at the very top. So what happened was there were so many things. It tried this and it tried that. It tried this, it tried that. And the things that I thought had some legs, like the story of Adolphus Bush coming to America, which would have been nice for immigrants and all that, and all entrepreneurs and all startups, it went and, psh, and went away. I think something serious happened when they turned it into a patriotic beer and they changed for one summer, America. And right now, where I live in this part of the country, the people who connect to Budweiser as their beer tend to be very conservative, patriotic types. And what's interesting about that is if there was a decision to say that's who we're going to own, well, that's like saying all the people who might drink a lager will take this chunk and alienate the rest. Because when you do it around value of that kind of patriotism, well, you have to know the polarity of politics in this country. As soon as you get political, you're against everything else and vice versa. I wouldn't have recommended that. They could have done something with the fact they've been around since 1876 and they, as a brand, as a beer, have been through all the changes of life, including ours, and show us as part of the grand sweep of history. Kind of like, like the Pepsi stuff that Shia Day did, you know, Forever Young. You know, that Any brand that's been around for a long time can definitely do that. But the, the patriotic sort of angle that they kind of went down for a while, which you can still smell in the latest commercial... Once a brand or the parent company starts playing with political thought, there was the Clydesdales after 9-11, you know, bowing down. That was perfectly fine because if you remember, go back and check the news, right after September 11th, the entire country was united for at least a few weeks, maybe even a couple of months where no one looked at anyone else as any separation. We were all together. That's what tragedies can do. But when you play into politics of any sort in a binary nation sort of as America is, you're really getting in trouble. You can see Bud Light, even though they aimed it in a very small market, it got shared everywhere. You know, the rainbow thing and the middle America conservative types who swore off Bud Light because of that. And then the crybabies and all the play. Once you step into that, it's hard to step out of it. It's really hard. But... Again, the theme of this thing is not talking about an American beer company. I'm sorry, Brazilian-Belgian beer <laughs> network. <laughs> and that didn't help it. Uh, and they didn't really deal with that the right way. At that time, the most important thing they could have done was to galvanize what this beer meant to America and the way they drink it, which we'll get to. Point is, every brand that's been around for a little while with any success, you have to know what made you that. And it doesn't mean you stay fixed and you never change. Like a human being, you grow, you renew, you change, but what makes you you has to be visible. Like the parents when the kids leave home. They may not look back very often, but when they do, be visible. And this is what a legacy, long-term brand success is like. Schlitz, you can't even find it anymore. At one point, it was like a number three in the country. And it just, I mean, there's business decisions. Some of these things are global business decisions. Some are business strategy issues. Some are pure branding. This isn't just up to an agency or a CMO. No. I mean, they have blood on their hands, but it's not that simple. When you know what a brand is, and you really want to make it sustainable for a long time. Again, my experience is with global Fortune 500 billion dollar brands. So this is my experience, this much my opinion. When I'm talking about the sentimentality of growing up in St. Louis and Anheuser-Busch, like most St. Louisans, <clears throat> that's my opinion and experience. 
But the thing is, when you got something that made you successful, make sure you understand it. Make sure you know exactly what that is and how it works so you know how to keep it fresh but consistent over time. The three principles of branding into billions that I preach and I teach every day is first, simplicity. A digestible, simple, I know what you are. Focus over time that you're focused on that and you don't diversify or or diffuse in a way that confuses people. And then three in the modern way, depth. From your packaging, from your practices, from your employee culture, to your marketing, to every single pixel you produce should brand you from that simple, focused differentiation. So we'll get to Stal Artois in a minute, but uh, Budweiser, it's this simple. Tell me if I'm wrong. Budweiser has always been a working man's beer. During the years when they had the highest growth of all, they celebrated workers, family businesses, workers, entrepreneurs, startups, physical manual laborers, all of that. And if I had the keys to that kingdom, I might rip everything off, off out of the world that had Budweiser on right now and rebuild it by doing this, taking all workers, yes, the oil rig workers, the construction workers, the iron workers, you know, the, the auto body mechanics, the physical manual laborers, and also people of today who crack code all weekend for an e-commerce site, someone who applies for a job in that horrible wasteland of online job applications, hundreds of applications in a week because they need to do it, a single mother who's, you know, managing the kids' schedules while trying to start a business while working a job, all the modern digital life workers and the traditional grit and sweat and stink and hard hats and rivets and welding and saws and oil and grease, put them together and say, all labor is valuable. Let the oil worker tell the guy who's putting in applications all day, all night on LinkedIn, trying to find a new job. Dude, I couldn't do that. And they can say, dude, I couldn't do what you do. Let a, a, a web builder, you know, say to someone who's a carpenter, man, I couldn't do that. The company says, I couldn't do that. Mutual respect, radical, surprising respect. Imagine them all shoulder to shoulder along the split rail fence at Turtle Farm, you know, as the Clydesdales go by, you know. Or two of them, interesting pairs of traditional and modern workers, as if they're driving the the thing. You don't see that. At first, they're just talking about their mutual respect until one offers them a beer and he says, no, I can't, I'm driving. Because, you know, he's got the, the, the thing. Celebrate labor. Now, compare that to being a patriotic beer. Of all Americans, a good chunk are patriotic, and some are really conservative patriotic, but then they tend to alienate other people out here. But people who labor, whether it's digital or physical, make this country what it is. And if we could say, if you work, this is your beer. You celebrate, the work is done. You celebrate, you did your best for a week. Right? This is your beer. In fact, if you know what their advertising was in the late 80s, it was two parts. You make America work and this buds for you. Perfect nomenclature, perfect verbiage. You, what we're just showing here, all the diversity of America, make America work for your work, and therefore this spot is for you. We make this beer for people who go to the bar afterwards and say, hey man, we knocked it out. Hey, or we did it, we succeeded, we got the contract, we brought it in on time, we finished building the deck, I finished the website, right? I started my own business, the website is up, or whatever, you know? I ripped the code, you know? I did all the things I had to do. The modern and the traditional, blend them together, all work is valuable. I dare say that could resurrect this beer brand, and it could have years ago. Enough about Budweiser. I'm not sure the next time I'll have a Budweiser, because when I go to the Indian restaurant, they don't have it anyway. I have a flying horse. But the point is, It's a worthy brand. 
it deserves to succeed. It deserves to be number one, not number four. See, when it was Budweiser and Bud Light, and then Bud Light and Budweiser, that's, that's tenable. But I hate to see a wonderful, worthy, legacy brand go and to see how it got there. I know how it got there, and I think I know how it got there. All right, the next thing is we're going to talk about Stella Artois. Now, it's really important. Do you know Stella Artois? What is your experience with Stella Artois? When did you first taste it or hear about it? If you're in America, if you're probably like most people, you heard it was kind of a yuppie beer and import a super premium beer. It wasn't even 12 ounces. But the thing is that it, um, it even came, if you got it at the bar, in a glass that they referred to as a chalice. Like trying to be like Guinness, there was a particular way you had to, you know, pour it and behead it and do all the things you do and present, you know, you make it precious. In fact, until a few years ago, Stella Artois, with some of the marketing that came from Europe and the UK over to here, the first things that they shared, it was still this very precious, super premium beer. Now, if you know the truth of Stella Artois, has it really been around since the 1300s, 1400s? No, not really. It's sort of a made-up beer. Not as made-up as St. Pauli Girl, but it's kind of made-up. It's not really what it appears to be. It's been around, but it's a super premium lager that's a little bit smoother, a little bit lighter. Uh, a lot of women like it. And because it was a very New York East Coast uh, beer, during the high time. But how did it get distributed here in the first place? And why did bars and distributors want it? You have to go back to, um, and if you don't know who the agency is, it doesn't matter. And if you know who the agency was, it doesn't matter. A London agency that created a world for Stella Artois. And if you follow me on LinkedIn, you see me post a lot of these where they created a world for this brand, a mythical world that seems to exist in a kind of neo-medieval renaissance, pre-World War I sort of place in France or southern Belgium, where people speak French without subtitles. And in some commercials, there's nothing said at all. Black and white most of the time. And using stories fables and experiences that show a ridiculous desire and personal valuation of a Stella. That you would sell your soul, that you would give up everything you had, that you would make someone potentially risk their life because you want a Stella. You would cheat, you would lie, you would steal because this thing is so desirous. There have been several very successful super premium brands built in our history and Stella Artois is one. And it was the two words that most of the campaign had, which were brilliant, revolutionary, reassuringly expensive. Now, I'm a writer and a designer and all those other things. Let's talk about the words reassuringly expensive. Ready? Reassuringly expensive. Why reassuringly? In a world where it's increasingly full of cheap, meaningless crap, it's reassuring that in this world, there's still something worth aspiring to of excellence, reassuringly. Reassuringly that those poor people can't drink it. Reassuringly I'm different from them. All that reassuring and expensive, you know? If you have to ask how much it is, right? And calling it expensive is such a bold, differentiating, brilliant way to position a beer. Because why would you say that if it wasn't? And if it wasn't, why would you say that? When people saw that world of this great cinematography, it's like a award-winning European film festival kind of quality stuff of these little playlets that happen in Europe, usually in a French-speaking, like I said, Southern Belgium or France, and some of it kind of plays with World War I, and some seems to play in another time. It just shows this obsessive desire and personal sacrifice to valuation of this incredible beer, Stella Artois. Well, 
That was done for several years. And you can find the stories, and I'll post some of the videos again in case you want to know. No, you find them yourself. They're on YouTube. But when you decide to make a super premium beer, you've got to do it like something super premium. And that brilliant, reassuringly expensive, the care and the craft done in those uh, films, the scripts themselves, the casting, the faces alone in some of those are worth several awards. That is what made Stella Artois, Stella Artois, reassuringly expensive a super premium brand, a super premium experience, everything right for that time. Now you could say, Paul, yeah, but that was during a certain time and people don't buy that stuff anymore. Oh, really? People don't buy things that are super premium anymore? Yeah, we do. But when it came to America and Americans got their hands on it, I remember I sent quite a few emails and messages suggesting Save your money and make this a big success. Just run the campaign from Europe here. Just run it here. You'll be fine. But you know, here's the point worth making. Agencies and sometimes marketing people are just too ego-filled and prideful and insecure to actually say, that would be a good idea. Just take the advertising and run it here. Jay Shiat said that to some clients about taking work that done in the UK that was really great. Just run it over here. It would work. And the Stella stuff would work. But you know, it doesn't happen very often. But I'll give you one quick example, which was in one of my Shy a Day videos. You know, I've 88 of them so far. I'm going to do more someday. The Porsche campaign that Shy a Day did, especially in print, had a typography and a look that was borrowed somewhat from when a period in DDB had it. But they got established to look with the fonts and everything. And when they resigned it to go after Nissan, yeah, Guy Day and I are like, oh yeah, why did you do that? They actually recommended to the, to the uh, client, hire Fallon McElligot. They're great. Let them do it. They'll do a nice job with it. Well, when Fallon got the account, guess what? They didn't change the typography. It's very difficult to try and say, just from looking at it, which was the Shia Day Porsche ad and what was the Fallon Porsche ad. Now, even after that, it changed, it changed, it changed. Uh, I think it was a good view for a while. And, you know, and then now Porsche is just, like most car advertising is awful. But the thing is, when something works and it's perfect, why change it? Because people want to change it. Agencies, when they get into account, the first thing they're going to do, we're going to change the logo. We're going to change the typeface. We're going to change everything you're doing. Before you even understand what they are and how they got to where they are. Yes, the Stella campaign from Europe would have worked marvelously here. But when they made it into a somewhat artsy European Sex in the City campaign, the Life Artois, or the whatever, applying, trying to get more East Coast women to drink it, whatever, I, I, I thought, okay. Uh, but the latest thing that was done, it's a thing where you see so many brands now, and I'll bring this in for a landing at uh, just over half an hour. One of the big sins of this industry is what is always called, it's in ad land. In ad land, everyone lives in this urban um, warehouse, condo, loft, everybody does. You know why? Because what everybody does, every time it's sunny and they've got dressed up and they got the product, they go outside and start dancing, right? That's ad land, ad land. And in the press release for the latest Stella commercial, it was very telling that the client side person said something about, you have to deal with reality you know, for this target audience, whatever they were talking about. So you have to stay in reality. When it was a press release for a commercial in which something completely unrealistic happens. Well, that's the thing. These press releases are not read by people who might be choosing a Stella when they go meet people for happy hour. It's written for us people. I wonder sometimes. And the video, um, I'll post a few of the videos under here, so you'll see the side-by-sides. 
I'm not going to rip them off and put it into this video because, again, that's that's an issue I don't want to get into. But the commercial is just another one of these things where something crazy happens in a warehouse building. And how many of those have we seen in the last few years, right? Even during COVID, especially, whenever people indoors, the, the, the figment of the imagination of Adland is everyone lives in the big urban city or wants to and wants to live in a in a cool loft because they because they want to and that's all they show them and of course they showed the top floor someone's got a stella and oh well, my goodness i think that is a racial you know uh what do you call it diverse stereotype image here of someone who does not traditionally drink stella well wow. because you see they hit the table and it starts falling the building is collapsing. It's going right through the floors. I mean, I'm sorry, 9-11? I mean, it's like, I think it's still too soon. These people are going through it every time the table gets larger and more people from a very diverse people who are not traditional Stella drinkers are around the table. And even though it's falling through the building and there's all this dust and stuff where there are open beers, one little scene you see in hand over there, but there's incredible concrete dust and brick dust and rubble falling. And they're just being so, oh, what's this? Oh, kind of cool. Again, is that realistic? What's it trying to say? They're trying to say, enlarge your table. Oh, bring you more friends around the table. Drink Stella at home and invite people who don't look like you. I don't know what the brief was from the client. I don't know what the brief was from the agency, if there was one, if there was a PowerPoint presentation and they said, shoot this, I don't know. But it's not a super premium beer anymore. It's just a beer, doing a regular Adland thing with Adland, very typical techniques and scenes. And it just seems like an ad. And what made Stella Artois special and valuable and importable was something brilliantly unique. So if you're a brand that's been around for 50, 60 or 100 years, if you're a brand that's been around for two years, and you've had some success, understand what got you there. Understand the essence of why people liked you enough to make you that successful in the first place. And every time the wind blows, don't throw it out the window and try something else. Understand who you are. Be yourself. I need to be myself. But your foundation's got to be there. Because if you do that, you can potentially galvanize success for generations. And if you keep changing it every two or three years, I hope you'll be in business in three years. Anyway, I hope this has been useful. And of course, if you have a contrary opinion, let's talk about it. And if you have anything you want to share, examples, to help make this a bigger issue, you know what to do. You know how LinkedIn works. You know how to post things and links. I look forward to it. Thanks very much for listening.